and we're going to sing our new theme song. And we want you guys to get excited about it. I want you to clap. I want you to listen. I want you to think of the words. Listen, this is very important. I want you guys to think of the, of the words of the same theme song. The whole idea of living so dangerously. And I want to read the I want to read the words to you. So pay attention. I need everyone's attention. Listen to the words. Faith is like a tightrope. I walk it every day. Though I'm on the ground, my spirit's heaven bound, no matter what men say. What am I so afraid of? Jesus conquered death and fear. I believe and know he is the way to go and has become so clear. And the course it goes, I want to live so dangerously to go where eyes cannot see. A greater step than I have taken yet, showing his strength through me. I want to live so dangerously in light of my eternity to face the day with a leap of faith, trusting all his ways. I want to live so dangerously. Second verse, to be strong and courageous. He's with me where I go. He's the guiding light to get me through the night. I want my faith to show. He makes the way ahead of me, oh, a lamp unto my feet. No need to fear, my God is always near. No better place to be. And it goes back to the course. I really want you to key in on those words and what, what you're saying and, and what it means for us as believers. And for those who are not believers, listen to the words and think about the words and contemplate uh, who Christ is and, and what he can do through you and, and for you.
but because you don't know the song, the next time we sing it after the service, after the message, you'll know the song. If we got time, you don't think we're going to have time? Uh, okay, we'll see what happens. All right, we'll leave it up to you in the Lord. Okay, you can have a seat. Restaurant, she goes, Tom! Oh, 
She was working for a tip and she got one. <laughs> but the question is, what do you look at when you look at in the mirror? How do you see yourself? Because oftentimes, for the next slide, there are two problems with how we see ourselves. First, oh, I forgot about this passage. Let's go to the next slide. That, that's not very good. Awesome. We tend to think of ourselves too lowly. Some of us have, have, have bought into a lie that you're worthless, or that you're not as good as other people, or that you have failed in some way. And you look at yourself, and maybe no one else realizes about you. But you have a pretty low opinion of yourself. But the other problem is that there are those of you who have the wrong opinion of yourself. You think too highly of yourself, as, as the book of Romans says. And you tend to think of yourself as better than other people. You tend to think of yourself as superior. Now, not superior, because everyone would say, you know, we're, no one's perfect, right? I've never, I've, I've yet to meet someone who'd say, yes, I'm perfect. The most selfish, self-absorbed, arrogant person I've ever met would not say that he is perfect. Right, Mr. Bell? No. Um, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. No, it's, it's easy to say, no one's perfect, and of course I'm not perfect. Everybody can say it. But some of us look at ourselves, yeah, we could say we're not perfect, but when it comes to individual circumstances, we would never admit our own error. Or at the very least, we, we tend to think of ourselves as, I'm not like those other people. So when we look in the mirror, sometimes we have a wrong conception of actually what we're looking at. I really don't look at Tom Cruise in here. If I did, that'd be real weird. <laughs> I see this. And quite frankly, it just looks good. Go to the next slide. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We know about the church at Corinth that the church was very divided. There are a lot of people who had uh, they're differing allegiances to different teachers. They had little cliques within the church. And there was a, an argument about spiritual gifts. Whose was better than others? And in, the con in that context, Paul says this. So starting in chapter 12, again, verse uh, 12. For just as the body is one, it has many members... And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that it lacked, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let's go to the next slide. So lie number one. We'll cover two here this morning. Number one, I'm worthless. We see here in, in, in verses 12 through 
um, 19 or 20. We see this predicament where you have this part who say, you know what, I'm just not as good or not as needed as some other part. Some within the church here thought of themselves as worthless because they could not do what others were doing. Some within the church of Corinth thought of themselves as not as important because they're not as seen as others were. And so we have this, this predicament where one doesn't feel as needed, as useful, <coughs> as valuable as the others. Let me illustrate it this way. <coughs> You recognize the two here? The great guy and the guy next to him? Mr. Dabula and myself. I wish I could be more like, I've often said, I wish I could be more like Mr. Dabula. To a degree. <coughs> If I were to walk up here, I could not play any instrument on this stage. You wouldn't want me to, to try it. You wouldn't want me to come up here and sing. You wouldn't want me to come up here and, and sing a song that I've written. It just really wouldn't work out very well. But since I can remember, <coughs> as a little kid, I remember wanting to be a singer. I, had, I remember this, this, this recurring dream or fantasy I had as, as, as a kid that I would be singing in church somewhere and all of a sudden the music stops and everyone looks at me and they say, wow, we didn't know that you could sing so great. Why don't you come up here and, and sing for us all? And of course I, in a very humble way, just dazzled the crowd with my incredible voice. That's a dream of mine and a nightmare of everyone else's. <laughs> it just wouldn't work that way. I remember in, in high school, in the Christian school I was at, I sat next to uh, two of my friends. Yes, again, I had friends so far. Uh, Tim and Steve, and sometimes my friend Anthony. Tim and Steve had incredible voices. They really had uh, just a great harmony together. And they would try to harmonize as we'd sing in chapel, and I'm just like... Shut up. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to just sit here and just not sing. Just, I don't want to mess them. And then I've always had that, that idea that I wish, if, if, I, if I could change my gifting that God had given me, I, I'd rather have some sort of musical ability. And if I were to judge myself on that basis, I would be a failure. Not only would I be a failure, but I'd be disobedient. Because I'm rejecting the call that God has given me. I'd be rejecting the gifts that God has bestowed upon me. You see, to some degree, it's a lack of faith. It's a lack of trust. So if I want to go down that route, yeah, you know what, I, I, I am going to have problems. Because I'm not trusting in the sovereignty of God. Let's go to the next slide here. The answer is in verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. The answer to this problem of, well, how do I feel valuable? How do I feel any sense of worth? Well, we do that as we trust in the sovereignty of God, that God knows what He is doing. And God has placed us in the situations we're in with the giftedness that we have, or that the giftedness we don't even know that we have yet. Your role in the body is important, but to see this, again, you have to think a different way. Let's go to the next slide. Romans 12.3. <clears throat> but by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Yes, this is not just talking about, okay, think humbly. Because he says, alright, you know, you shouldn't have a high opinion of yourself, 
you should you should think more realistically, taking in all uh, all of your shortcomings and, and problems and failures. But this says something a little more. We not not just to think, okay, humbly or realistically, but according to what God has done. The illustration here, you would not think to judge the abilities of a fish by the way it flies. You wouldn't judge the value of a painting by how it tastes. I don't know what would possess you to do that in the first place. At least fish you could throw. Or I guess some pop through the water or something. But... These, these illustrations are, of course, they're, they're, they're ridiculous, right? But when we look at ourselves and we look at what God is doing in our lives, the goal is not just to say, okay, well, I don't, I don't want to be prideful or arrogant, but I want to recognize what has God given me to do? What is my part in the body? Not necessarily what I want to do or I, I want this position or that, but what has God given me? And what do I need to cultivate as God has gifted me in that particular manner. Let's go to the next. A proper evaluation. You are an image bearer of God. When you think of yourself as worthless, or, wait a minute. At the very least, you bear the image of God. You were born in the image of your Creator. You are important enough for the King of Heaven and Earth to take notice of. You are valuable enough for Christ to give His life for your sin. You've been blessed with talents and gifts that others need, even if you don't or they don't recognize that at this moment. So we want to look at the mirror and see the true picture. This involves prayer. This involves trust. And this involves a relationship with Christ. To see yourself for who you are. Well, let's go to the second line. Not I'm worthless, but I'm awesome. Verses 21 through 26, we have here the hand saying, uh, uh, in, or the eye saying, I don't need the hand. Or the part saying, I don't need you. Well, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, we obviously, we're using some hyperbole here, right? This is big, I use the right word. Hyperbole, etc. Went to college, learned a vocabulary word. Everyone there. Yes. It's obvious that if you were to cut off a part of your body, the other parts of the body are going to be affected. If I were to chop off your pinky toe, you would notice it. You wouldn't think, well, I've got nine more, no problem. <laughs> or hey, at least it's, you know, I write with this hand, at least I don't need. Well, your whole body, your whole person is affected by that. The pain that that, 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 that cause is going to affect your mind, it's going to affect every other part of you. So it's a ridiculous thing, but sometimes we fall into that trap and we think that way. Let's go to the other, the next slide. I put up here a, a picture of, of Milo Tasker, uh, who's now up in the West. I put him out there because when I first moved to the Midwest here, I had a pretty high opinion of myself. Now, I know you're thinking, Mr. Thompson, you still have a pretty high opinion. <laughs> but it was worse then, okay? I had a, an air of superiority that I had to deal with, although I didn't know I had it. I thought of myself as pretty, when it comes to theology, as pretty well advanced than other people. You know, I pretty much knew what was going on. We had a, a bad church situation we were coming out of. And, I, and originally I came here and I, I told my wife we'd just stay here for a year until I figured things out and I'd get back into, you know, a real job. <laughs> hey, seven years later I'm still here. <laughs> I haven't found another job yet. <laughs> no, I liked my job. I plan to keep my job for a little while. If that's what I'm Maybe not our we'll see. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's um, but I came and I thought, you know, I really knew what I was talking about, and I knew more than, well, most pastors. I was an idiot. <laughs> and so I, I came to this particular church I was at, and I, I sat under uh, 
this, this, this pastor was preaching, and I realized, this guy's smart. And then I realized, this guy's really smart. And this guy was so smart, he was smarter than me. I know. It got to the point where I thought, maybe, maybe I need to bring a dictionary to the church with me. I don't know, he's using some words here, though. I, I really had not even heard of it before, and I, I have a Bible college education here. And it began to dawn on me, the more I got involved here, the less I actually knew about what I was talking about. And it really showed me how much of a jerk I had been for the past couple of years. And it was really a humbling experience that God had to, to bring me through. And I'm sure there, there's more pride and arrogance that needs to be taken care of as well. But it was an eye-opener for me to see that, you know what, I really wasn't as great as I thought I was. So who is it that you think you're better than? Why do you believe that while other people may have value, because I don't know anyone would say, well, you know, that person doesn't have any value, but... You're just a little more valuable. You're just a little better. Thinking only leads to arrogance and selfishness. This also leads one in despair because you realize you're not going to be able to live up to the standard that you set for yourself. And at some point you're going to realize you are not who you thought you were. And it's all going to come crashing down. Let's go to the next slide here. What's the answer? Again... Think realistically. Think as God has done. On the contrary, Paul said, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. <clears throat> and we realize that we really are dependent upon other people. What you see up here, even in this chapel service, whether it's me or, or the man, we realize all of this took place because of other people and the assistance of other people. Take those people out and... Wow. If Noah hadn't made this trip, we'd be, I don't know where we'd be right now. And if others who, you know, even the camp itself, we didn't set any of this stuff up. We are incredibly dependent on other people, whether we realize it or not. You think of the great athlete that you respect or you look up to, whether it's yeah. LeBron James? Oh. Um, I don't know. You fill in the blank with your favorite sports star. Someone passed him the ball. Someone coached him in college. Russell Wilson? I don't know. Aaron Rodgers. Okay, I know Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Aaron Rodgers is a great quarterback. He doesn't have anyone to throw to. It's not going to work, right? You can't have a touchdown by throwing the ball into midair only, right? You need someone to catch it and to run with it. Or at least catch it and not drop it, right? <laughs> we all are dependent upon other people. God wants to honor the humble, not the proud. And you're dependent upon other people. Let's look at the next. <coughs> the next slide. A proper evaluation. You are a sinner in need of God's grace. There's always someone who can do what you do, but better. You are who you are only because of God's sovereignty. You are dependent on others for all of your achievements. And God has called you to serve others with your gift, not ignore others because of them. God has gifted you in certain areas, in certain ways. And He has gifted you... <coughs> In order to serve others, your gift is not for you. But instead, some of us take those gifts and we say, well, that's why I'm better than someone else, because I can do this and they can't. I can get the straight A's. I can uh, play in the band. I can get the ball in the hoop. Well, other people can't. But that's not why you were given your gift. You've misused what God has blessed you with. the next slide. I'm trying to show The truth in the middle that knocks you over. I've heard it said, and sometimes I hate this phrase, I don't think it's always right. 
But some have said, the truth is not found in either of the extremes, but somewhere in the middle. So we've talked about two lies tonight. One that says, I'm worthless, and one that says, I'm just awesome. Well, there's somewhere in the middle here that we need to be. Number one, you are a sinner, unworthy to stand before God with anything you've done. There's nothing that you can bring before the throne of God and say, now see, look at this. I've done this. I said this. <clears throat> I accomplished that. Obviously, you want me in there. Well, if we look at ourselves the way God does, and we see sin for what it is, and we see the sin that affects every part of our body, we understand, I get nothing of which I can boast. I got nothing of which I can be prideful about. Second, you are loved by God who created you with a purpose. You were not created by accident. I hate that phrase that some people use, oh, you were an accident, you know, mom and dad really didn't mean to have our child. You just kind of showed up. <laughs> no one was created by God by accident. God doesn't make accidents. God creates with a sovereign design. God creates with a specific purpose. You have a purpose for your life. That purpose is only found as you grow in your relationship with Him. Number three, because of Jesus, you are accepted by God, despite your sin and despite your failures. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that we can stand before the very throne of God because of what Jesus Christ has done. Philippians tells us that we have a righteousness that is not our own, but has been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand before God, the almighty creator, the sovereign of heaven and earth, on the basis of someone else's works. It's Christ who brings us in. We who are not worthy are made worthy only because of Jesus. That's how much He loves us. Because of that, yes, you need Jesus. Whether you are talented, or whether you have not yet found your talents. Whether your tal talents are obvious, or perhaps hidden. Whether you are smart, or you are me. You need Jesus. You need the grace of God in your life. No matter where you are on the spectrum. Because if there's one thing that's true about every single person, no matter what their level, no matter what their race, no matter what their background, is that you are a sinner. <clears throat> the only thing that can overcome your sin is not just trying harder, not just doing better, not just a firm resolution, but it's a complete reliance on God. It's a complete abandonment of my ego, of my pride, of my sense of accomplishment. Said God, it's only about you. And once we understand that, once we have that down, once we've embraced the grace of God, we can bestow that grace and that mercy upon other people. Tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about truth in this world. We're going to talk about how the world needs to see us unified together. The only way that we can be unified together is if we recognize those commonalities that we have. A, that we are sinners before God, and B, that we are all recipients of God's grace. And see, we can only do this if we are in Christ. For some of you... You don't know Christ. You know of Him. You've heard Him in Bible talk. You've heard Him in church. You've heard Him in, in, in whatever. But you do not have a relationship with Him. You are not a Christian, and you may even understand that. You know that. And my, my plea to you, my desire for you, is to know Christ. Recognize your sin. Look at yourself realistically. But then look to the cross and see that there is forgiveness and there's mercy and there's grace. I know anyone here, 
any of these teachers here would love to talk to you about that. If you don't have that relationship with God, you just don't understand uh, even what that's about. This is the night to settle that. This is the time. This is the place to figure those things out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are sinful creatures dependent upon you for everything. Lord, you gifted us with different gifts and different abilities. But all of that comes from you, not just our inner motivation or talents, but they are gifts from you. Help us to see what you have been doing in our lives. Humble us to see our sin, but to see your great work in spite of that. Lord, I especially pray for those that are in this room here that really don't know you. They don't know what we're talking about. They don't know what this relationship is about. Lord, I pray that you would work in their heart as only you can do. Lord, we pray that you would bring them to a same knowledge of you. We pray that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, use us as instruments to do that. Lord, we humbly pray for this in your name. Amen.